Hey everyone, this is Adam Calloway, Director of Ministry with the Timothy Trust, and I have the privilege of being here with Josh Moody, Dr. Josh Moody, who is the Senior Pastor of College Church in Wheaton, as well as the President and Founder of God-Centered Life Ministries, uh, which broadcasts preaching content over various media, and I know there's there's blogs and Bible studies and various other resources you can find on GodCenteredLife.org, and I thought uh, with Josh coming to to speak at a couple of the Timothy Trust preachers, refreshers coming up here in Ontario, as well as Pacific Canada. It'd be fun to have him for a little chat on expository preaching. So thanks, Josh, for joining us uh, with the Timothy Trust. Thanks, Adam. So good to be with you. Yeah, brother. Well, uh, I thought maybe I'd just start by asking, what what are you preaching through right now uh, mm. at College Church? And, and what are some insights that you've gained from from your study and in, in your week to week expository ministry there in Wheaton. Yeah. So we're going through the book of Judges at the moment, which is uh, a fascinating store set of stories. And I'm really enjoying it. And uh, what have I learned from it? I, th I don't know whether this is like a new, new insight, but it's coming with fresh reality as I work through it is just how relevant the book of Judges is to contemporary uh, the contemporary church to contemporary culture as you know the the message of the book of Judges is all orientated around the narrative of God's people abandoning God as their king and therefore leading to increasing chaos and you get these judges figures who are meant to be heroes but are sometimes more like anti-heroes frankly and the, the, the message over and over again is if we want health in our spiritual lives and in our churches and in our countries, we need to center our lives upon God. And it's it's just a it's a really relevant book. And I I, I love preaching through narrative stories and uh, some pretty amazing stories in the book of Judges. So that's always fun. Absolutely. As well. It'd be fun to it'd be fun to do a chat sometime. Maybe when you're done, we can uh talk through um maybe just some helps on preaching through judges sometime i think that'd be fun but yeah. um with your with your word preach the word content uh conference coming up with god-centered life i thought we could talk a little bit about uh solid preaching solid biblical truth or expository preaching in a shifting cultural context as that's the mm -hmm. theme of your your conference there and i wonder just maybe just to start there's a lot out there in, in preaching world about the importance of exegeting the text and exegeting the culture or sort of exegeting the text and exegeting the context. And so how what thoughts do you have about these things? And do we need to balance the two? Do we need to blend the two? Or what sort of insights do you have along those lines? I suppose I'm ambivalent about that sort of rhetoric. Part part of me resonates with the commendable desire to reach the people who are actually around you. And I think that's what's driving the idea of exegeting the culture. You need to have a genuine understanding of what's happening around you. And there certainly a biblical precedent and reason for that. And most famously, Paul's uh, work in Athens, where he noticed that they were highly religious and saw all the different gods and said to what you worship uh, as an unknown god then i'm going to i'm going to proclaim to you and so you and so there's a part of me that goes well absolutely and so my ministry now in wheaton in chicago land in that's in that way of looking at life needs to have a different shape to it than it did when i was in new haven connecticut next to yale which is a very different kind of context so part of me goes, oh, yeah, well, for sure. I mean, it's a basic principle of mission. And Adams, you know, I was on the mission field for just a little bit. And when I was working uh, with college uh, ministry in the Republic of Georgia and a little bit in Azerbaijan, the context of that for Bible studies there was you know, <laughs> pretty different than from Wheaton. So uh, and and I spent a lot of time trying to learn languages and figure out um, what's going on culturally and I, I do the same uh, did the same when I was in Cambridge and in New Haven and Wheaton look around observe carefully I, I sometimes I sometimes say idols 
are hiding in plain sight. So you want to look at what people are really worshipping. So all that, I think, is pretty important. On the other hand, and so this is where the ambivalence comes from. On the other hand, as a preacher, uh, our, our job is to preach God's word, even when it is countercultural, as it always is countercultural. So we can't be driven by the culture around us. We have to be driven by God's word and what he, he's given us a message to proclaim. And we don't want to be like those people that Paul warned Timothy against who, who are just gathering around teachers who want to say what their itching ears want to say. So the primary thing has to be faithfulness to what God is saying in the Bible uh, and, and then applying it in a way that you, you trust by God's spirit will, will land Will, the hearts will be softened and hear it but of course sometimes they weren't and so the danger of always being driven by contextualization is that you end up shifting what you want to say because people are not hearing it well sometimes people don't listen but we still have a job to tell them which isn't an excuse to do it badly and uh, or nor an excuse to misunderstand what's going on culturally I, 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 so i think it's more nuanced than that than often is pre presented and the first thing of course is faithfulness to what god has said and not shifting that around sometimes uh, i've heard people say this and i think by my observation it's pretty much accurate too that one of the great sources of heresy in the church is a comes from a well-intentioned but misguided desire to be effective in evangelism <laughs> because <laughs> What goes on is because you want to be evangelistically effective, which of course we do, and we need to be driven to do that. But we mustn't therefore change the message in order to reach the people. We're just, we're not fishing them. We're just becoming fish. So that's no good. Um, <laughs> the, other, yeah, the other thing I might say is in my, I've done quite a lot. Obviously I'm from Britain and I'm now in North America and I've worked in different parts of North America and, and Britain and uh, the former Soviet Union. And so I've done ministry in different cultural contexts. And there is a reality to cult different cultures and cultures change and all that is real. But there's a bigger reality, which is human nature and the power of the gospel. And fundamentally, what people need is to be loved. Uh, they need the truth of God. Uh, we're all sinners. So, and that is the that is is exactly the same across culture. So the the gospel is designed by God to to cut right across culture. Other things uh, uh, function very differently in different cultures. Friendship functions quite differently, but the gospel is the same. So we don't change it, even though we're aware of the different cultural context. Yeah, it sounds to me like what you're saying is I, I've heard it described as you know, there's getting it right. And then there's getting it across. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And like the get Absolutely. it right, the get it right dynamic is is really what the Timothy Trust is all about as as preachers are trying to to be faithful. And then the getting it across is is a little bit harder to teach. Um yeah. And, yeah. and it takes like you may you may get it across in Wheaton a little bit differently than we'd get it across in Ottawa, or if you're listening from alberta or if you're listening from mm -hmm. the atlantic region in canada or if you're yeah. in the or if you're preaching to 12 year olds rather than 50 year olds it's going to be a bit different right so getting it across takes a lot of, of wisdom and mm -hmm. but there is a verse that the timothy trust really focuses on as is sort of central to our convictions and that's uh second timothy 2 15 which you know do your best to present yourself as a worker god approved rightly handling the word of truth so getting it right mm -hmm. and and so with this topic of like shifting cultural dynamics while we're trying to communicate solid biblical truth um do you think that shifting cultural dynamics changes at all what second timothy 2 15 is trying to communicate and if so how so oh no i don't think it changes that at all I mean, it, it, Paul. Paul addresses uh, Timothy as a as a man of God, which is referencing Old Testament 
shapes of of the prophet of god the man, the man of god in the old testament bringing god's word we need to rightly handle uh so that to me i would fit that into the and i think you you i think would uh, into the framework you had of getting it right mm -hmm. so i don't think that i don't think that shifts at all and it is a and we need to constantly uh watch your life and doctrine carefully make sure we actually are giving a balanced account of the truth uh, understanding what the text says accurately and you know with an awareness that not only the different contexts are different personalities and different styles and people will do it in a slightly different way but um we need to be faithful with what the bible is actually saying so i don't think the i don't think the cultural context changes that it may make it more risky i mean it was more risky for timothy and, and paul than for us in north america and probably even for you in canada uh it may make it more dangerous it may make it uh apparently easier uh, ease can make it um seem easier but actually be more difficult but i don't think it changes the the rightly handling the word of truth no and, and if anything it makes it more important and there's pressure to give up on that task mm -hmm. and we need to hold hold to it uh not not in a sort of uh, ostrich sticking head in the sand ignoring issues kind of way we need to address them but um yeah you talk about wisdom how to get it across i like that is a good way of putting it that does require wisdom insight prayer counsel from others skill creativity i think that's sometimes an under emphasized uh, part of preaching because you don't want to be creative with the meaning of the text you want to be conservative with the meaning of the text but the communication does require creativity and so but that doesn't i don't think that changes the rightly handling the word of truth cutting a straight line i think john stop talked about in that way in that kind of way cutting a straight line through the text and it strikes me that doing your best brings some of those getting it across dynamics into play as you rightly handle the word of truth mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. if you go if you go ostrich <laughs> you're yeah. probably not doing your best right or you're scared and you, you you sort of hunker down and get into a into a sort of fortress mentality circle the wagons I, you see that sometimes with christians when there are changing cultural dynamics they instead of trying to win people they're they seem to almost trying to alienate people and the very idea of winning someone seems like well you are you compromising no <laughs> we're not compromising again that's that's making a, a confusion between sticking to the truth of god's word and then trying to keep and then aiming to communicate that word in a way that's going to be heard and is loving um I, uh, perhaps the phrase winsome has been used uh, to mean in some circles sort of compromising around the truth but we we do need to be winning people for christ uh what's the old book the divine art of soul winning who is that mm. remember who wrote that book i can't remember now but anyway. i don't i don't yeah the divine art of soul winning <laughs> but yeah i think it is an art um there's definitely science science to the task of of rightly handling the word of truth but it's also a great mystery mm -hmm. um I think I'll ask you two more here, brother. Um, what shifts in culture? So if, if this is a, a shifting cultural context that we find ourselves in, whether you're north of the border or south of the border, what are some of the shifts in culture that you think are particularly valuable for expositors to be aware of today and why? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think we can't assume a broad consensus around christian truth i suppose that's obvious to anyone who's under 50 or 60 i think but or maybe four i don't know exactly but uh, you, you there are i it used to come across preachers who it seemed to me that they were assuming that basically everyone believes that they're just not practicing it so there's a lot of rhetoric about we need to the, the problem is that our preaching isn't practical enough it needs to be more practical well, of course what's that's assuming is everyone believes it they're just not practicing it uh no <laughs> no the reason why people are not practicing it is because they don't believe it 
So you need to you need to connect the dots between faith and practice. You can't assume that people basically think that Jesus was God and came and died and rose again, but they're they're enamored by consumerism and so they're not putting it into practice. No, the reason why they're not putting it into practice is because they don't actually believe that Jesus is God. Otherwise, they would. And so, so I think mm -hmm. that'd be the first thing. You can't it, our preaching needs increasingly and again this depends the extent to which is true i think this depends upon the context it was far more true for me in new haven than it is in wheaton but it's certainly true here too our preaching needs to have apologetic content woven through it because you can't assume that people believe it the christians in front of you may believe it but they may believe it with less conviction and certainly the context around us doesn't believe it. So those Christians who go out, they're interacting with people who don't. So the so I suppose that'd be the first thing. We can't assume a broad consensus of Christian truth. I, I think the other thing is we can't assume a consensus around truth at all. So uh, to make the case that Jesus is God, you're also needing to make the case that a, a an ultimate claim to an exclusive messiah is not intellectually nonsense nor thirdly ethically troublesome which is so part of the the big challenge facing the church today is that the charge that it's become that holding vigorously to christian truth is sort of nasty and and, and um exclusive to to to, to alien, alienating people and all the rest so um so we need to make the case apologetically for christian truth for truth and for the uh the the, the to follow jesus is good <laughs> it's like that's the good thing to do for you for your church uh for, uh, for the future of uh, of uh, uh of god's glory um and uh so that the the ethical argument needs to be made as, as well as the intellectual argument um i think the other so those i suppose are more all sort of heady things i think the other piece is there are a lot there's a lot of um i don't know whether you find this to be true or not adam but i i, I think people are more fragile than they were um there's more uh, anxiety uh those those you know mental health issues and all so so while standing firmly for the truth um we need we need to be well, always need to be gentle but i think there's a there's an increasing need richard sibbs um was called the great puritan richard sibbs was called the sweet dropper his way of preaching and i think there's a need for that kind of sweetness so that when people hear us preaching they're not this not just like a firebrand shouting but this is this is um there needs to be clarity conviction but also a feeling of compassion that goes with it i think people mm -hmm. need that a lot these days strikes me that that second one that you mentioned not assuming that people think that christianity is even okay uh would be a right. particular challenge when preaching the book of judges <laughs> yeah yeah well i mean uh, i think you have to be one well, sunday we're looking at the last bit of gideon and gideon completely stuffed up so some of the, the not all the examples in judges by any means are meant to be exemplary uh, quite a lot of them are meant to be the very reverse mm -hmm. this is what not to do yeah, and while it, while it sort of unapologetically gives you a window into the like sort of open garage mess of Christian leaders, um, there is that resolve of there's no king, therefore mm -hmm. every man does what is right in his own eyes, and yep. which cries out for our need for for Christ, and mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Um, hopefully, hopefully that'll help. But I, I could imagine there's being some, some places, you know, see, that's, that's what the Bible, that's what the Bible says. You see, that's, that's why Christianity is a problem. So, yeah. um, yeah, I think being apologetically sensitive, um, I guess, homiletically gentle, compassionate, 
and uh, but also clear and bold um, are the challenges of expositing, expounding the word of God in our day. Mm-hmm. Um, last thing, brother, um, I think one of the cultural narratives out there as well is that, you know, come on, get with the program. People aren't going to sit down and listen to a 30 to 40 minute expositional talk. This is sort of an outmoded way of, of communication. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet we come to the end of Second Timothy and you get one of the most powerful imperatives preceded by this, like, you know, I charge you in the presence of Christ Jesus and by his coming kingdom and all these things. Preach the word, Timothy. You know, there's this task is is doesn't have an expiration date on it. Um, how how can expositors sort of think through these dynamics? Is, is there any truth to that narrative that people don't want to listen to a monologue? And if so, how do we sort of combat that and be faithful to the charge? Mm-hmm. Well, there's no virtue in long and bad sermons. So, uh, I mean, I, I sometimes you come across the sort of idea that a sermon, wow, he preached for 55 minutes. That's amazing. Well, <laughs> maybe, maybe not. So, uh, on the other hand, you can only fit so much content into a certain length of time. So, if you uh, sermonettes produce Christianettes, if you're just being fed on a diet of 10 minutes, you're not going to be able to think very accurately about anything. Uh, so it's another balanced thing. I think it's also uh, some preachers are good over 50 minutes um, without mentioning names, but I can think of uh, preachers who are really good over 50 minutes. I'm not so sure they're quite so good over 30. They need a bit more time. Mm. And then I can think of other famous preachers or well-known preachers who are really good over 30, 35 minutes. And then I've heard them preach 55 and i think actually they were better over 35 so some of it is knowing your own capacity as a preacher what you're actually where you're uh where you're really good john stott i think was best slightly abbreviated i mean not abbreviated 35 40 minutes i think he was at his best Uh, i've heard dick lucas go significantly longer than that and been great so uh, they're both are were fantastic preachers it sort of depends so some of it's your own uh knowing yourself how long do you typically go for josh and and what what are some of the factors for why you want to be in that range i tend to be about 35 40 minutes i have preached longer than that at times i think some of that we have three morning services so we have an 8 9 13 11 so that that determines that Mm-hmm. Um, to those who say that no one these days can take long content I, I just think that's self-evidently not true I mean Jordan Peterson uh, has right. long form YouTube videos and you say well maybe he's just an amazing communicator okay so maybe he is but he still can't say therefore that people don't listen to it when he's got like you know an hour and a half talking about genesis chapter one great great length with <laughs> two million youtube views i mean so yeah i don't think that. And the other thing i think actually as people get the younger generation uh prefer more content and longer that's my experience so hmm. if you're ministering to college not not teenagers but if you're ministering to college students young adults they like longer more content because their brains are just firing on all cylinders as people get older middle age they get tired and busy you know you have to have mercy on the young mother who's been up all night i mean she you know how can someone who's had an hour's sleep for the last month be expected to listen for 50 minutes it's pretty tough mm-hmm. so um, family ministries tend to have it's simply better to have like slightly shorter sermons and as people get older they tend to like a, a little bit on the shorter side because mm-hmm. most people's brains, apart from, you know, the, the greats perhaps in their 80s or something, can't can't take quite so much content. But people in their 20s and 30s, often the argument is, you want to reach the young people today, you've got to have short sermons. Well, that, I don't think that's true. What you need is um, dynamic, energetic, biblical 
contentful material. And that that's what, you know, people can, their brains can take it. So anyway, those are some thoughts. I think I'll take that back to our young adults and I'll say, hey, <laughs> you know, Josh, Josh Moody told me that you guys like me to preach long. Yeah. What do you mean? You want me to stop <laughs> after an hour? <laughs> I'll tell them. I'll tell them that's why. Uh, <laughs> yeah. oh, that's fantastic, brother. And I, I hope that conference, I know it's coming up soon in October. And um, yeah. will there be people will be able to benefit from that uh, through God-centered life uh, afterward? Yeah, we'll, if they're able to make we'll, it in person? Yeah, I don't think we'll live stream it, uh, but it will be recorded. Okay. And wordconference.org. And I'm really looking forward to being with you guys soon. That's going to be fun. Yeah, we're looking forward to it uh, up here in Ontario. And then next June, if you're listening out West, uh, Josh will be joining us and doing some work on preaching the book of Ephesians, I believe it is. And so um, looking forward to that. Thank you for taking the time, brother, to talk through a, a helpful topic um, for all of you out there uh, listening, trying to handle the word of God faithfully. We hope this was a blessing to you. And uh, just would encourage you to to keep on going to present yourselves as workers God approved, rightly handling the word of truth. Thank you, Josh, for being with us today.